don't know if you paid particular attention to the words of the gathering hymn, but I'd like to just lift them up, a few of them up for you. Uh, the second verse concludes with this phrase. May I, uh, um, we probe the secrets of the atom yielding unimagined power, facing us with life's destruction or our most triumphant hour. I would like to use that idea that uh, life's destruction, which we might call death, uh, it can either be a great tragedy or it can be our most triumphant hour. And I think that that concept is picked up in the final verse. As each far horizon beckons, may it challenge us anew. Children of creative purpose, serving others, honoring you. May our dreams prove rich with promise, each endeavor well begun. Great Creator, give us guidance, till our goals and yours are one. I can't think of a more appropriate hymn that we might think about or reflect on or sing as we contemplate the concept of our own death. St. Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul holds up for us a contrast between this worldview and the worldview that Jesus references as the kingdom of God. One is centered in love of self. And maybe one might expand that to love of family or love of clan, maybe even to love of nation. But it is a love that is centered in self. The other worldview is centered in neighborliness. A neighborliness that is inclusive of the whole of creation. A neighborliness that is grounded in God's Sabbath economics, which is all about caring and compassion for all. It's all about seeing that there is a just distribution of God's gifts of creation for all people of the earth. It is not about accumulating or hoarding, but rather it is about distribution and sharing. Life, the true abundant life revealed in Jesus of Nazareth is about loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Self-love is very important, but only as it assists us in loving God and loving neighbor. So that living well is all about living a life centered in gratitude and generosity and thankfulness for the blessings that we have received. Dying well is also about a life of generosity and thankfulness and gratitude and about relationships. In short, while stuff is necessary for our existence in this world, it is not what life in this world is ultimately all about. And interestingly enough, neither is it what death is all about. Death is about fruitfulness, about giving to God the things that belong to God. It is about legacy. When we die, the question might well be, what are we leaving behind? That is the question that marks the timber of a lifetime. We leave 
behind our attitude toward the world. We are remembered for whether or not we inspired in others a love for life and an openness to all those things, uh, all those who lived it with us. We will be remembered for our smiles and for our frowns, for our laughter and for our complaints, for our kindness and for our selfishness. We leave behind for all the world to see the value system that marks everything we do. People who never asked us directly what we valued in life never doubt for a moment what it was. They know if we cared for the earth because they watched us as we seeded our flower beds or as we let the debris from the garbage spill over into what could have been a garden. They know what we thought of people of color or creeds, of other color or creeds, by the language we used and the lives we connected with. They know the depth of our spiritual life by the way we treated those around us and what we thought of life and what we gave our lives in doing. We leave behind the memory of the way we treated strangers, how we loved the individuals closest to us, how we cared for those who loved us, how we spoke to them in hard times, how we gave ourselves a way to satisfy their needs. We leave behind in our very positions on death and life, on purpose and meaning, a model of our relationship with God. If your life was a life that was measured in generosity and thankfulness and humility and compassion, that is the legacy that you will leave behind. And if those attitudes and activities brought meaning and fulfillment in life, they will also bring meaning and fulfillment in death. In a death-denying culture, death is often viewed as the end of all things. It is viewed as being very private and very individualistic. But I would like to propose to you this morning a different orientation, a different thought construct for thinking about death. I would suggest to you that death is not static, nor is it individualistic, but rather it is quite organic and very communal. It is not about the end of all things. It is about the beginning of new things. There is a quote attributed to Martin Luther that goes something like this. We know as little about life after death as a baby traveling down the birth canal knows about the world they are about to enter. Now on the one hand, that baby that is about to enter the world, we can say it certainly has quite a few individualistic aspects associated with it. But in spite of that, life is not individualistic. The saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. And none of us would have anything or be anything if it were not for that which we had inherited from those who have gone before us and the witness and the legacy that they left behind. So life is more communal in nature than it is individualistic. And I want to make that same claim about death. So I begin with Jesus' statement in the Gospel passage selected for today, unless 
a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I'd like to tie that imagery together with Jesus' statement from John 15. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Later, Jesus will say to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. If we took the time to unpack that, we would begin to discover that ours is not a theology of glory. Jesus didn't send us out for accumulation of stuff and power and dominion and might and wealth. Jesus sent us out to be servants of all, as the Father sent him. So the abundant life that Jesus comes to reveal is a life that is achieved by our being in Christ. Christ who was broken and poured out for the sake of the world. And that is how true abundant life is achieved. Or as St. Paul put it in Romans, Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Here we see that death far from being an individualistic event, is indeed a very, very communal undertaking. Ours is not a theology of glory, but a theology of the cross. We are called into community with Jesus the Christ, and we are buried with him. That is, we are also called to be broken and poured out for the world's sake. That the transformation of this world will only take place in this manner. The way revealed in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. A life and death into which you and I have been called and baptized. Throughout scripture, the concept of living and dying, of life and death, these are great metaphors. Metaphors that we usually interpret in the life and life of the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. But there is another great family of metaphors that come to us in the words of Scripture, to which I would like to call your attention, and that is the metaphors that are associated with the plant world. Imagery of the plant world begins with the very story of creation itself. In Genesis 1, we are told that God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. Biologically, as we look at the plant kingdom, we see that plants accumulate nutrients from the earth and energy from the sun. And they use those nutrients and the energy from the sun and they store it up in order that they might grow and mature. But the goal is not simply growth itself. The goal is to produce fruits. Fruits which contain the very seeds of new life. And if all the plant did was to accumulate those nutrients and that energy and store them up and never reproduced itself, never produced the fruit, then the sustainability of creation would cease. 
And so the goal is simply not accumulation and growth. It is reproduction and sustainability. And when that seed is eventually produced, its effectiveness depends upon it falling to the ground and dying in order for it to achieve its crowning achievement and purpose for being, namely to grow up and produce another plant and produce more fruits so that the sustainability and the renewal of creation continues. Unless a grain of wheat dies and falls to the earth, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I would like to suggest to you this morning that dying is a very communal activity. And dying well is very much a part of living well. That is, part of the task of living and dying well is that in the mature stages of our lives, the goal is to relinquish and disperse that which has been accumulated over the lifespan to produce fruit, so to speak. The first stages of life are all about gathering nutrients for the sake of growing and living well. But the last stages of life, of our earthly life, are about releasing that which we have accumula accumulated back into the world for the sake of the world. How do we do that? I think we begin with an awareness that we are mortal, that we will die, that resurrection is God's business, or as Martin Luther put it, the afterlife is God's business so that we don't have to worry about it. So that if we live with the awareness that we are indeed mortal and that we are going to die, we should live as if death was not was not a we should live as if death was a natural part of who we are and what life is all about. Far from something to be afraid of, death is the natural and the normal end of life on this earth. Thus it seems to me that there should be some intentionality about what we desire to achieve through life. And that, by definition, includes some intentionality about the end of life. To die knowingly is to live in such a manner that our goals and our values are fully expressed in our dying, as well as in our living. So the question is, what kind of legacy are you going to leave behind? What legacy for your children and your grandchildren? And what about the community and the culture that nourished and sustained you in your living? Will you nurture and sustain it in your dying? And what about your faith relationship with God? A God who called you into a relationship and who walked with you throughout this life. Will that partnership continue through your death? I want to be clear here. I am not suggesting where or even how one should distribute their estate. But what I am suggesting is that those decisions are very much about dying well, just as they are about living well. Here's a statistic for you to wrap your mind around. It is estimated <coughs> that in the next five years, it's not very long, folks, that in the next five years, ten trillion dollars will be in the process of changing hands from America's senior citizens to their 76 million baby boomer children. <laughs> In five years, $10 trillion will pass to the next generation. What will they do with it? I 
I want to be clear, I do not covet your gifts for the church. Where you give, what you give, how you give, that's all up to you. But my task is to remind you that you are mortal and you will relinquish all of your accumulated assets. What you decide not to do, the government will decide for you. So your legacy could include charitable gifts to cultural things such as the arts. We're living in a time when theater and symphony and opera are all being scaled back because there are not enough financial resources to sustain them in a tight-fisted economy. Or your legacy could include charitable gifts that sustain the major institutions of civilization, such as medical or educational endeavors, and so that they could sustain the continuation of those things which brought meaning and purpose into your life. Or your gifts could sustain and continue the faith communities. The ELCA has a foundation through which you could leave a gift. You could leave a gift for anything that your heart feels passionate about, anything that reflects the life that you lived while you were alive. You could leave a gift, a legacy for world hunger, for missionary work, for church planting, for justice advocacy, for our seminaries and colleges. Imagine a pastor graduating from college and seminary, what their educational debt load is like these days. Almost any aspect of the work of the church can be endowed and sustained through bequests through the foundation. Or on a more local level, Think for a moment of what the Seminary Lutheran Church could be doing right now if it had had an endowment fund from the very beginning of its existence. And think of what the Seminary could do in the future if such a fund was started now. Dying is very much part of living. And it is very much a communal activity for people of faith. To make no decision is to decide. And if you don't make the decisions about your estate while you were alive, society, that is the government in particular, will make them for you when you die. Living well and dying well means that we live intentionally about the decisions we make in life and in death. Amen. <laughs>